Hey everybody and welcome to chapter number six. We are beginning our first chapter on memory. Um, I will be honest, when I was putting together uh, these these three kind of, you know, the next three lecture slides slash activities, um, I, I, I kept finding that certain examples could fit into both chapter six and seven. Some could fit into both seven and eight. There's a couple of ideas that would work best in six and eight. So, you know, um, a lot of these ideas kind of feed into one another. They all kind of inform one another. So um, this is one of those uh, you know, chapters where you definitely want to make sure that you feel good with chapter six before you move on to seven because it's going to kind of keep building on a lot of the ideas that are formed in this chapter. So um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not trying to scare you, uh, but I was giving you a heads up. Uh, so let's get into it, shall we? So uh, the videos that I have prepped for us today, um, I got a lot for you, uh, but I'm only going to focus on, you know, a couple of these. I'll let you know the ones that I feel like you should see. I feel like this one right here is a pretty good one to check out, the Flickr task, because we're going to be talking about the Flickr task uh, later today. Uh, but to give you a little bit of an idea about what some of these other videos are, because I do show these in my in-person class to varying degrees, uh, the first one here is an interview with a journalist named Joshua Foer. Uh, Joshua Foer uh, wrote a book called Moonwalking with Einstein, and he gets interviewed about it in this very old video. Uh, you can't find this video on YouTube, so I had to link back to the Comedy Central site. Uh, so I hope that the link is still is still open. Um, I've been showing this video for for several semesters, and every time I click it, you know, at, you know, at the beginning of the semester when I'm making these things, I'm like, please tell me they haven't taken down that <laughs> that interview yet. Um, so you can find it here. Uh, the interview um, talks to Joshua Foer, who just published his book about his memory. Um, basically, long story short. Jo because we'll, we'll visit in again with him in chapter 7, uh, but Joshua Foer uh, was a journalist who, who checked out the, uh, the National Memory Championship over in New York City. And he essentially found out that everybody competing in this memory championship, none of them were savants. None of them were these amazingly gifted prodigies. They were all just these normal, regular people. Um, and he realized, like, hey, wait a second. If they can do this, I can do this, too. So he trained really hard for one year and then became the U.S. national champ in memory. Uh, so very fascinating kind of story. This text, uh, this book, um, uh, there's a capstone that I teach about memory. And the first time I taught that capstone, this was required reading. Like, I, I made everybody read this. We read it along uh, together as a class. It was, uh, it's, it's, you know, you don't need to be a psych major to read it. It can be any, for anybody. Um, it can be for your mom and dad, you know, if you um, want a good, you know, Christmas gift for them. I, I recommend it. Some of the some of the language ha has not hold up, has not held up, uh, but uh, very interesting. Um, so the Flickr task, I will revisit that in a second. This video here covers a lot of these same ideas, but this is one of those that I made uh, as part of like a separate YouTube channel. So I'm a little bit embarrassed by it, but uh, I think it's good information. It has a couple of good examples in case you get stuck on any of, these, uh, on any of the ideas here in this video. And then finally, we're going to be talking a lot about Clive Waring in this chapter and the next chapter. We've talked about him very briefly this semester. He's the guy that um, had a, basically had a disease that uh, destroyed part of his medial temporal lobe and as a result lost all of his memory and is unable to create any new memories whatsoever. Um, so you can watch, this is a long video, it's an hour long documentary, uh, came out a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, I think if you watch the first five minutes you'll get a pretty good idea of what's going on and you don't need to watch too much beyond that. But we'll check in again, like I said, more with him next uh, next chapter. Uh, yeah, next chapter. But it might be some of you I think might find it interesting, and you would want to uh, you know watch the full thing. All right, let's get into it. So today we're going to be talking about Herman Ebbinghaus, some really early memory research. We'll be talking about how memory is conceptualized today, and then we'll talk about the three steps of uh, or the three components of memory: short-term memory, long-term memory, and sensory memory. All right. So, I've used the M word a couple of times here. What the heck is memory? Very similar to in chapter 5 when I asked you what attention was, and I didn't really give you a solid definition because I said, hey, it depends on how you measure attention. That affects what the definition of attention is because it depends on how, how you operationally define it. 
very similar to uh, to memory as well. Oftentimes, you're going to get a you're going to get something like this is which is from your textbook. The ability to recall events or in information not present in the current environment. So that would be like if you closed your eyes and then repeated that sentence back to me. That would be an example of memory. Why? Because you're able to recall information that is not currently presented to you because you have your eyes closed. It's not there presented to you. So uh, if you are able to recall it, that means you have a memory for it. If you aren't able to, then you don't have a memory for it. Simple as that, but as you're gonna see, it really, dep it really depends on how you are talking about memory. If you're talking about memory for events that happened earlier to you today, that is one form of memory. If you're talking about memory for um, uh, vocabulary words, that is for a different form of memory. If you're talking about your memory for how to tie your shoes, that is a separate type of memory as well. So there's lots of different types of memory. We're gonna be looking at a variety of them. Episodic memory, semantic memory, long-term memory, iconic memory, working memory, implicit memory, explicit memory, short-term memory, uh, sensory memory, I'm just uh, perspective memory. I'm just trying to think of some of the others off the top of my head. Um, echoic memory. There's a lot of different kinds of forms of memory uh, that we can talk about. I get really passionate about this stuff because, as I told you, I teach a capstone on this. This is one of my specialties. My dissertation was all about memory, uh, so I'm, I'm uh, very excited to, to walk through these next three chapters with you. To give you an idea of what to expect, and I don't want to talk too much about this because I've already done enough housekeeping at the top of this video, uh, the first chapter, what we're talking about here, this is going to be about the structure of memory, so what does memory look like? How is it organized? The next chapter, chapter 7, is going to be about how we are able to retrieve those memories. So this is where we're going to be talking about a lot of the uh, the tips and tricks and strategies for how to have a good memory, how, how to get the most out of your memory. We'll talk about that in chapter 7. And finally, chapter 8, this is where we start talking about some of the strange things about memory, such as false memories and amnesia and um, uh, people who have perfect memory. So what is it like to have a perfect memory where you never forget anything? Uh, savants and things like that. We'll be talking about that and, and emotional memory. So we we'll talk about post-traumatic stress disorder and things of that nature. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of, you know, there's a lot to talk about and if we wanted to, we could talk about this all semester long. Um, so let's get into it. Now, um, this video is going to be kind of awkward because I'm going to be asking you to participate for some of these. Um, but I'm not going to ask you to do it as much as I would if this were in person. So some of these I'll just be like, hey, pretend X, Y, and Z. But there's going to be a couple where I'm going to ask you to actually try it. This is one that I want you to actually try. So if you don't want to try it, you don't have to. But if you want to, if you want to play along, I'll give you the opportunity to. What I'm going to need from you is just a, pe a pencil or a pen and um, uh, a piece of paper. Or if you want to, you can minimize this video so you can't see it, but you can still hear it. Uh, and then you can pull up a Word doc or a Google doc and you can open up a new tab or whatever and start writing stuff. So let's go ahead and start. I'm going to do a very quick memory test for you. So I want you to either close your eyes or to minimize this tab while I read the next, I think it's 15 words for you. All right, here we go. Last chance. So look away now. Here we go. I'm going to read these out to you. Coast, destruction, spot, afraid, clever, cowardly, Oceanic, Zephyr, Flowers, Branch, Pipe, Floor, Juicy, Crib, and Carpenter. I'll read those one more time. Coast, Destruction, Spot, Afraid, Clever, Cowardly, Oceanic, Zephyr, Flowers, Branch, Pipe, Floor, Juicy Crib Carpenter. Okay, so go ahead and, and start writing those down now. Write as many of those as you can remember. Um, as we talked about, uh, or well, you know, pause it, I guess, you know, so you can write them down. I'm going to go ahead and keep talking. Um, 
in chapter one we talked about George Miller and we talked about you know the magical seven plus magical number seven plus or minus two so on average most people on this task are gonna get somewhere between four to seven of those right you know, that's how many you're gonna remember some people can remember more than that some people can remember up to nine but generally speaking you're not gonna get that much more than nine most people are going to do a little bit less than that all right, so I'm going to do one more, uh, one more no, uh, set of, of, of words. We're going to come back to these ideas. So hold on to your sheet of paper or your Google, uh, uh, you know, Word doc that you have open. I'm going to do the same thing one more time. A new list of words. So close your eyes or minimize this, and here we go. Report, compete, please, inexpensive, black and white, acrid, squeak, offend symptomatic, contain, glamorous, camp, rail, board, snow. Okay, so that is your list. I'm gonna read it one more time. Report, compete, please, inexpensive, black and white, that's one word, acrid, squeak, offend, symptomatic, contain, glamorous, camp, rail, board, and snow. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna, add, don't write those down yet. I'm gonna ask you in a couple of minutes to write those down. Okay, so let's start here by talking about Herman Ebbinghaus. Herman Ebbinghaus is, uh, he is uh, a very interesting kind of figure in the history of psychology because a lot of times when we talk about the history of psychology, we talk about different schools. We talk about, oh, you got, um, you got uh, Titchener in Leipzig, or sorry, not Titchener. You got Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig. You got Titchener in New York. You got James in, in uh, Boston. Um, so, you, you know, you kind of talk about these different kinds of schools of thought by coming from these different kinds of pockets of, of academia. Herman Ebbinghaus was mostly just kind of working on his own. He didn't really have a laboratory where he worked with other folks. A lot of times he did testing on himself. And for a lot of reasons, we call him the first kind of memory researcher of the modern era. You'll find some philosophers talking about the nature of memory. You have a lot of uh, authors and, and novelists actually talking about it, like Charles Dickens talked a lot about it. Uh, Marcel Proust wrote his masterpiece uh, about it. Um, so you had a lot of people talking about it, but it wasn't really until the late 1800s that people started systematically studying it using the scientific method. Uh, and as I mentioned, a lot of his work was done alone. He was testing himself on a list of things, and he would have a very strict regimen of uh, testing himself on nonsense words. So uh, he, each of these words, and this would be in German, because uh, he was uh, from Germany, uh, would have a consonant, a vowel, and a consonant. So he'd come up with words like lur and fub and wep. These are not actual words, right? These are nonsense. Um, why is that important? Because if you're trying to remember the word lur, uh, then what comes to mind? To me, just the word lur, right? If I ask you to remember the word cat, what comes to mind? Oh, I can imagine a kitten, right? So the fact that I may have a cat, that I have experienced cats, that I can picture a cat, those all might bias how well I do in that memory task, which is why he's going with these nonsense syllables. Um, to prevent any kind of uh, uh, bias or familiarity effects. So his test was really simple. All he really did was just kind of try to study a list of nonsense words and then wait a while and then test himself again. So you memorize a list of words, you give yourself some time, and then you test yourself. And for Herman Ebbinghaus, he would do this until he got 100%, and if he didn't get it 100%, he'd start back from that list and try to memorize them again, give himself the same amount of time, then test himself, and then keep going until he got 100%. And he would document this every step of the way. How, what was his accuracy? How long did it take for him to, uh, to remember all, the entire list? Um, and, and does that, how much he remembers, does that change over time? So now is a really good time to pause this video and write as, much of, as many words as you can from list number two, now that we have had three minutes between the first list and the second list. All right, so take a minute, write as many of those as you can. Okay, I tried to look like I was paused. 
for those of you that didn't actually pause the video. Uh, but um, almost everybody should find the same thing if you tried this, uh, you know, without too many distractions. For your first list, you're going to have many more words than you did for your second list. And the reason why that's interesting is because only three minutes had passed, and usually you're going to have a pretty big step down, like you remember about half as many words as you did in, in list number one. So if I'm thinking about, you know, or I want you to think about a lot of these things like with the mindset of how can I apply this to my daily life? What does this mean about how I can improve my grades and stuff like that? This demonstration should be kind of frightening, right? Because what this means is that if you try to cram for an exam, let's say you study you know, an hour before um, uh, you take the exam, in that hour, you're gonna forget a lot of information within just the span of an hour. And I know this because you forgot quite a bit just within the span of three minutes, right? So um, that's, that is called the forgetting curve. This idea that we immediately start forgetting information and that as time goes on, we actually forget a little bit less. This is a super common finding. Ebbinghaus was the first to really kind of put a name on it and to kind of you know systematically research it, but you've probably experienced this stuff on your own daily lives you know, um, as a student uh, uh, yourself. So this is not actual data, this is just idealized, but to give you an idea about what the forgetting curve is. You can imagine, let's say that you need to study and uh, this is gonna be how much you remember for the exam. So let's say that you study and then right after you finish studying, you go in and you take the exam and you remember a, a fair amount of it. Okay, cool, fine. But let's say that you study the night before. So you study one day before the exam. In 24 hours, you are going to forget roughly half of that information. And I know that's roughly half. I think that number is actually that we'll forget about 40% of it. So it's a little bit better, maybe. But it really depends on the kind of information you're talking about. But the picture's not good either way. That you're going to forget a lot of information within the first 24 hours. So, you're going to remember only about 50% of what you study. Now, if we move from day one to day two now, we go from 50% in this case to about 37%, right? So now we are going to drop about 13%. That is, uh, that's nice compared to the huge drop of 50% here, but it's not great, right? It means that after two days, we only remember about a third of the information we studied, which is frightening. Now we go to the next day, so from day two to day three, now that has dropped to about 23%. Well, what is that? That's not 23%, that's, I'm gonna say that's about 26%, right? Which again is about 9%. And then if we go from here to here, that's about 26 to about 18, right? That's a difference of 8%. That basically what, what I'm trying to say is that with each additional day, we have forgotten less as time goes on. The first day we forgot 50% of it. The next day we forgot 13. The next day we forgot 9%. The next day we forgot 8%. So what this means, this is good and bad news, by the way. The bad news is that that means that whatever we study, we can we can bet that we are going to forget a lot of it, right? That we can count on our memories to fail us. But the good news is that once you make it past these first couple of days, that whatever you then remember, you're, you're going to stand a, a, a good likelihood of remembering that the next day, in the subsequent days. And so if you're looking at day four to day five, that we're really only changing you know, from about 18% to about 16%. And then from day five to day six, about 16% to about 15% or so. Um, so another way to think about this is if you think about what you learned in the previous semester, whatever classes you took, think about like how well you would do on an exam if you took it right now, right? You probably wouldn't do super good. Um, but whatever grade you made on it now, it having been weeks, you know, since uh, the previous semester, um, if you were to then wait another week and then take it again, you'd probably have basically the same score because at this point, you have forgotten, you know, each day you're gonna forget 
only a tiny little bit of that class. You've already forgotten most of it, right? Um, so now you, the big important things, those are the things that stick with you. Those are the things that kind of hang around in your memory. Um, all right, so that was a lot of info, uh, and a lot of this info we're going to kind of see throughout the chapter. But this is the core idea of, of Ebbinghaus, this idea of the forgetting curve, that instantly we're, we're going to forget a lot of it, and as time goes on, we're going to essentially um, uh, forget less as time goes on. And that's not the only thing that Ebbinghaus discovered. He also discovered uh, something called savings acquisition. Saving acquisitions is this idea that... Um, if you were to, let's say that you took social psychology uh, your you know, last semester, if I asked how well would you do on, on social psych uh, right now, you might say, oh, I don't know, probably not very good, I'd probably fail that exam. If you were to take social psych an, again, you'd find like, oh, all this stuff is coming back to me very, very quickly. I don't need to relearn this stuff. Or maybe you sit down to relearn something really difficult and you find that it comes to you very quickly, right? That is savings acquisition. The idea that experience with something before changes how, you, how quickly you can learn it a second time, that is savings. Um, so even if you feel like you forgot something, like let's say that, um, uh, so uh, let's say you forgot how to play a song on guitar or on piano. Whenever you go back to try to relearn it, you'll find that you pick it up very quickly, much faster than the first time you tried to learn it. That is savings acquisition. All right, so let's test our memory. I want you to try to uh, uh, list all of uh, the words from the first list. And you can do that by looking at these word stems. So this word stem, the first three letters come from that word, and then you can just fill it in. So the first one is k something, right? So see if you can, and try to write down as many as you can remember now. Pause it, <laughs> if you want to do that. Okay, so I assume that you paused by now. What you should find is that not only did you recall the words that you remembered? But you probably using this also recalled a bunch of words that you didn't remember the first time. Maybe you forgot coast from the first, uh, you know, the first time you did this. And, but then this time you got it because you had the first three letters acting as what we are going to call a retrieval cue. The same for carpenter, right? Oh yeah, carpenter. Because you had car and car helps you Retrieve the rest of it. Carpenter. Zep. Uh, what did we do? Oh, yeah. Zephyr. And Oceanic. And uh, I don't remember all, all of these off the top of my head. Um, I do kind of want to go back and, and look. Like I'm pretty sure this is African. Um, I don't remember what cow was. Was it cowboy? Hmm. Brazen, I think. <laughs> Um, but, you know, good chance you did better than me because you're actually trying to remember these. I was just reading them out. Um, but here, again, we can demonstrate the same thing with list two. If you go in and try to recall these, you'll find that you actually remember them a lot better than you thought that you did, right? Um, that a lot of these are going to come back to you whenever you thought they were gone. So then the question is, like, well, wait a second. I remembered acrid, but I didn't remember it whenever you asked me to recall it after just three minutes. And, by the way, ten minutes has gone by since then, so why is it that my memory is better than it was? The answer is that these retrieval cues are going to help us retrieve the remaining part of that memory. And the implication of that is actually really profound. And this is an idea we're going to come back all three chapters. What that must mean then is that when we forget something, it's not because it has left memory. It's not because our memory is blank. It's because we forgot how to retrieve that memory. We forgot the retrieval cue that was going to help us retrieve the rest of that memory. Because if you saw these retrieval cues and then you remembered, oh wait, this one was acrid then what does that mean? It means that that memory was in there somewhere, you just didn't have the ability to access it. All right, so let's, uh, oh, f sorry, one final thing uh, before uh, we move into uh, the more current kind of research on memory. 
uh, is that the forgetting curve is true for other species as well. This idea that you know we start out remembering a lot and then we go on and remember less, uh, that has been demonstrated with dogs, with cats, with pigeons, with dolphins. Um, it's been done with lots of different animals throughout the animal kingdom. Um, and he also found something else that's also been kind of demonstrated throughout the animal kingdom, which is the primacy and recency effect. And this is uh, the phenomenon that you may experience if you make a list, uh, a mental list, I should say, of things to pick up at the grocery store. You'll remember the first few things, the last few things, but you'll forget a lot of the things that were in the middle. Um, you also probably experienced this with the presidents of the United States, too. You could probably tell me maybe the first couple and you can tell me the last few, but you may not remember all that much, right? You remember Obama, and you remember Trump, and you remember Biden, but do you remember before that, that it was Bush number two? Before that, it was Clinton, and before that, it was Bush one, and before that, it was Reagan, and before that, it was Carter, before that, it was Ford, and before that, uh, it was who was before it was Nixon and before that it was Kennedy and then before that it was Eisenhower and then uh, before that it was Truman and then it was Franklin Roosevelt and then it was who I could go on but I'm not gonna do that because uh, I can't see you being impressed or I can't see you rolling your eyes because you don't care uh, that I learned this little memory trick from some of the ways that uh, the things that we'll talk about in chapter 7 um, all right so um, and also, if you think that I quit on Hoover because I didn't remember before Hoover, you better check yourself because before Hoover, it was Wilson. Uh, so um, let's talk about that. Why is it that we can remember the last few things and the first few things, but not the ones in the middle? This is called the serial position effect in your book. The serial position effect is this U-shaped curve. Why we can remember the first few things in the, la in the list and the last few things in the list, but we don't really remember the things right here in the middle. Um, so Herman Ebbinghaus discovered this back in the 1800s and it wasn't until you know like the 1960s and 70s that American psychologists really started studying this uh, in America largely because that wasn't really until cognitive psychology really kind of kicked in. After Ebbinghaus um, in the 1800s the reason why it took a long time for uh, for this research to get picked back up in the 60s is because behaviorists really didn't find this to be an interesting kind of route of investigation they can't really see inside the mind so why speculate about these internal mechanisms about limitations you know so why speculate on that stuff and a lot of the questions about memory kind of changed their focus so that they became about questions of classical conditioning about you know how long does this association last or how long does this particular stimulus control the behavior x or y um, and so in the, in the 1950s, that was whenever George Miller, in the late 1950s, 1957, in 58, that was whenever uh, people started thinking about it more as a cognitive type of question. All right, I was going to do one more quick kind of uh, demonstration on this, but I'll let you do it on your own time if you want to. In the classroom, what I would do is I would read out these 60 words and have people try to recall as many as they could. And what would happen is that they would get the first few and they would get the last few and a lot of these in here in the middle they would forget, thus demonstrating that very lovely primacy and recency effect. All right, so now is a good time to pause it, take a quick break. Uh, before we start kind of the next, the middle third of this, the structure of memory. All right. Oh, oh actually, let me take a sip of coffee. Okay, let's talk about the structure of memory. So this right here is the modern con uh, conception of memory. This framework is not perfect, but it's going to account for almost all the memory that you deal with on a daily basis. So we have input, and then we're going to have output. And so all the stuff right here is in the middle. So we have incoming sensory information, right? That can be visual information, can be auditory information, whatever. The first thing that we're going to experience is our sensory memory. And if we're not paying attention to it, then it doesn't go any further. And if that sounds familiar, it's because we talked about this when we were talking about the broadbent filter model or the Ann Treisman early selection attenuation model in chapter 5. So we have to focus on it in our sensory memory. 
we have to pay it attention, and if we do, then it gets over to the short-term memory storage. Once it's in short-term memory, we have the ability to kind of rehearse it, to think about it, to talk about it. And if we don't spend time there, if we don't pay attention, if we don't spend time drawing connections with this information or emphasizing why it's important, then we're going to lose it. Then it's going to be gone, and then we have to kind of start back over here if we want to try to relearn it. If we're like Ebbinghaus and we want to test ourselves until we remember it uh, perfectly, then we'd start back over here and try to do a good enough job main, uh, rehearsing it, making it important to us, then it would go over to long-term memory. We say that it is encoded, and once it's encoded, then we can retrieve it, and that retrieval is going to be our output. So that is ultimately what we mean when we're talking about memory these days. Long-term memory, by the way, long-term memory can be years long. Uh, Short-term memory is, depending on who you're asking, I'm going to say anywhere between 20 seconds and 60 seconds. So it's not a couple of hours. Like, I feel like sometimes people talk about it. Like, if you don't remember where your keys are, that's actually more an issue with long-term memory and not so much with short-term memory, unless you were just had your keys in your hand. This is also referred to as the Atkinson and Schifrin model uh, from the 1960s. Uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but basically this is also called the modal model the modal model of memory. Uh, when it came out in the 60s, people were in love with it. And then in the 80s, people kind of got bored with it. And then in the 90s, people got back on track and started loving it again. And that's because um, there was some pretty good neuroimaging evidence for this happening in the brain, uh, which wasn't possible in the 60s. Uh, and so kind of helped bring it back into, into popularity. All right. Uh, so the book does a good job of emphasizing this, that there's not really one place in the brain where memory takes place. It's very, very easy for us to point to the hippocampus, the parahippocampus, and the hippocampus being you know, right around in this area right here. Um, but there's actually lots of areas that memory um, are gonna activate. So when we talk about sensory memory, for example, the first stop uh, in the memory adventure, that is really going to depend on the area of the brain that help perceive it. So if we're talking about visual information, the, the area where sensory memories are stored for vision are going to be in the visual cortex. For language, so for hearing, it's going to be stored in the auditory cortex. For touches, so for, you know, um, remembering the texture of something or remembering a certain kind of pain, that would likely be somewhere over here in the parietal lobe on the S1 in that uh, primary sensory cortex. If we're talking about smell, good chance it'll be in the olfactory bulbs over here, but also over here in the olfactory cortex. Um, so uh, sensory memory really depends on what kind of information it is being stored in. Short-term memory, on the other hand, is almost exclusively going to be over here in the prefrontal cortex. You're going to have a lot of people talking about the DL PFC and the VM PFC. That is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Those are bi both big players in our discussions of short-term memory. And then finally, we have long-term memory, which is distributed throughout the cortex. It's going to be all over the place. You know, everywhere could potentially be a place that memories are stored. So when we talk about the importance of the hippocampus, you know, this little piece right in here, that's because the hippocampus is going to help us decide where this info gets distributed. It's going to, you know, put it in these different places. So it's, it helps consolidate, it helps kind of organize, but it doesn't actually, and it's going to help retrieve in some cases, but it actually doesn't actually, there's not, not a lot of memory stored inside the hippocampus, which is a very common misconception. All right. So here it is, here is our model where we have incoming info, we got our sensory memory storage system, our short-term memory storage system, and our long-term memory storage system. Uh, so we're gonna focus uh, for now over here in the sensory memory section. So one of the kind of hallmarks of the sensory memory uh, section is that it has a huge capacity and a very short duration. One of my favorite uh, characterizations of this um, 
he's a guy that I was in, in grad school with, smartest smartest man I know, um, and uh, he uh, he's actually working at Penn right now, so he's he got a job in the Ivy Leagues, um, but uh, he. He, you know, made his uh, early career talking about uh, working memory. Or sorry, I have a, I say working memory. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Talking about m the differences of memory, about short-term memory versus sensory memory, and he always talked about sensory memory as having, um, as as having uh, a very robust capacity. And what he meant by robust is that it's a huge capacity that's also very, very detailed. But the downside to it is that it has a very, very short duration. It doesn't last very long at all. Um, and it's a problem that it doesn't last very long at all. Um, and we're talking less than a second, by the way. We're talking very, very short. So sensory memory is going to be very, very short, but the actual resolution of the memory, the accuracy, is going to be incredible. It's very, very good. Maybe my favorite example of a sensory memory is um, color after images. That's usually lumped in as an example of a sensory memory. So if I were to um, show you this, for example, if I were to show you this Rubik's Cube, and then you blink your eye, and you close your eyes for a quick second, you can imagine what it looks like in perfect clarity, right? That is your sensory memory. And after a couple of milliseconds, you know, or after 200 milliseconds, then it's going to, your sensory memory is going to get really, really bad very quickly. Um, all right, so um, where is this in the brain? This is in those areas that help us perceive vision or hearing or touch, and it's ongoing activation from those sensory regions act as they storage there. So I was talking about how, you know, for visual items, it's going to be here in the visual cortex. That's because there's that area is still active; it's still processing that, and that is going to be uh, the memory that we're talking about here. A lot of studies in cognitive psychology are going to focus on visual or auditory information. So we're either going to show people pictures of stuff, or we're going to make them remember lists of words or numbers. And for that reason, um, we know a lot about iconic and echoic memory. Iconic memory is going to be memory for visual sensory information, and for echoic is going to be for auditory sensory information. Just like how um, for a brief second, if somebody is talking to you, and they immediately stop and then ask you, you know, what did I just say? If they, if they ask you fast enough, then you might be able to say the last few things that they said. And that's because of your echoic buffer. You have this really short period of time where you can kind of recall some of these ideas before they leave your brain, before that activation is gone. Um, and it's likely that you know we have more than just the iconic and echoic memory storage systems. We have them for the other main senses. They just don't have words. They don't have names for them because they're just not as studied as much. So uh, I'm going to show you a very quick video here. Um, let's see how this does. Uh, so here is a, uh, a, a quick uh, task. This is a, what's called a flicker task. I'm going to warn you because this is going to have uh, flashing lights. So if you are photosensitive, just beware that this is going to last about 30 seconds. All right, so this is flickering, right? And so what happens here is that there is something that changes in this image. So I want you to try to see if you can identify what it is that is changing. So as it, this image is interrupted by that gray screen, something is added and something is taken away. Can you spot what it is? As it moves back and forth, I'm giving you a second here. Can you figure it out? All right. So it's this engine right here. This big engine, it disappears and it comes back. And now that you've seen it, you can't unsee it, right? And that's the effects of top-down processing. Now that you know where to look, you can't unsee it right there, okay? Uh, so if you are surprised, that is called inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness is something that happens whenever something is presented in front of us and then it goes away and we don't even know that it's gone. That, um, is super, super common, especially in uh, movies, where you have, you know, like a shot and you have things going on in that shot, then it cuts over to somebody else talking and then when it cuts back, 
maybe that person's makeup is slightly different, their hair is slightly different, maybe the set is a little bit different, a chair is out of place, and we don't even notice it because we're not paying attention to it. Um, and because the time spent between those shots, the first shot and then when you come back to it to compare, is going to be longer than 50 milliseconds. And because it's that short, at that point, we may even already forget, oh, this is weird, for some reason you can see the cursor here. And, it, and it's, okay, I don't know. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I just noticed something strange uh, about, there we go, about the PowerPoint. Um, all right, uh, so that visual mask right there in, the, in between those images, that's called the visual mask. And what it's meant to do is it's meant to prevent or to flush any remaining kind of sensory uh, storage information. So that way you can't rely on that. Because if we were to come back to this image and I were to just do this, Oops. Okay, if I click on that, and then I click on this, and I click on this again. <laughs> Sorry, I keep clicking on the on the gray screen. That's not good. All right, there we go. All right. The point that I'm trying to make is that if you have no delay between these two images, it pops out to you immediately. Uh, and the reason for that is because you still have your visual sensory memory, right, for that information, and then is immediately compared with the incoming picture, and we can identify what's going on immediately. We can identify that it's that uh, 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 jet engine. All right, so that is sensory memory. Okay, the, there's another example, I'm not, I've already talked too long, so I'm not going to show it to you. This is from the 1960s, a Sperling article, uh, and essentially you're going to get kind of three numbers or letters right here on a grid, and then they're going to go away. You're going to see them for just a, a flicker of a second, and they're going to go away, and usually people are really, really bad at remembering info. But if I told you I want you to look at the first row, the second column for this one, um, and if I show it to you for a split second, you'll be able to do really, really well on that task because you're able to apply attention for that letter or number um, and, uh, and, and retain it into your short-term memory at that point. So kind of a boring video because it, it walks you through you know that, but it gives you instructions and it's kind of fun for that reason. All right, um, so let's talk about short-term memory now. Uh, while we do that, actually, now would be a really good time to take a quick break. Um, and I say that because I just got an email from a student, so uh, I got that on the brain. So if you want to, let's take a quick break before we talk about short-term memory. All right, so short-term memory is, um, like I said, it really depends on who you're asking it could be between 20 seconds and 60 seconds. Some people will say that this goes up to as long as two minutes. Some people say that this, you know, that 20 seconds is too short, that it's actually maybe 30 seconds. The whole point though is that it's not, it's not much longer than a couple of minutes, if that. That it's very, very, very short. Um, and its capacity, as you learned already this semester, is about seven plus or minus two items. But, People have, and I and I alluded to this in chapter one. People have have kind of tested this for, throughout the years and found that whenever you control for things like familiarity of the word or of the number, or if you make sure that people can't chunk items or rehearse them uh, using you know advanced skills or whatever, that actually that number is probably about four plus or minus one. That is actually much shorter than this. Because when we're talking about remembering phone numbers, you know, phone numbers, what, 10 digits or something like that? The way you're able to do that is because you're able to chunk them together. So for me, it's the example I gave was 912-334-1278, let's say. If I do that, that's one, two, three, four. That's only four numbers that I'm actually remembering because I'm saying 912-334-1278. So, um, more recent research shows that, it, that our limitations are actually much more marked than that. Um, so, here is an example of, um, of memory and, and, well, you'll see. <laughs> I, I'm, 
I'm curious how, you know, if this will impact you the same way it does for students when I do this in person. Because when I do this in person, people are actually kind of shocked because they're disappointed they don't actually don't remember what the real penny is. So take a look at this and see if you can remember which of these is actually the real penny. All right. So which one is it? It's our friend over here. Abraham Lincoln over here in the top right hand corner. Usually this causes a lot of trouble for students. Why does it cause a lot of trouble for students? It's because, uh, well, I, th this is why I wish I could ask you. I'm curious to hear what you think, why you think it's hard to remember. Because you might say like, oh, it's because, you know, in this day and age, we don't really deal a lot with coins. You know, we don't really, you know, handle change. But I did this exact same exercise when I took cognitive psychology back in, I think the year would have probably been 2009, maybe. Um, wow, that is, ooh, yeah, that is, that's been a while. Um, but uh, I remember in that example, back then we used coins all the time, right? Um, so we didn't have any excuse. So what is your excuse? Because you can't say it's because you don't really deal with pennies all that much. The reason why is because the actual content of a penny, what's on it, is not important to you whatsoever, right? You might know that Abraham Lincoln's on it, but if I asked you about any of these other details, if I asked you where was the year, or you know, if the year was on it, and where the year is, is it on the front or on the back, or is it behind Abe, or is it in front of Abe? Um, those kinds of questions, you've never needed to know that. And so for that reason, this can be a really hard thing because I'm, I'm not saying that your memory is bad. What I'm trying to say here is that this was never in your memory to begin with. You never paid it attention. And so for that reason, it never made it over to long-term storage. So I have a very quick activity for you. Um, uh, yeah, this is one of those where like, I'm just going to tell you what I would do in person because this isn't one that I can really simulate all that well online. Whenever I do this in person, I split the class up into three different groups. And I give one of those groups, I'm going to give the instruction, uh, does this word have the letter, ooh, spelled letter wrong. <laughs> letter H in it. Okay, so that's one question. Second question. Uh, does this word rhyme with, let's say, um, fair? And then finally, does this word fit? And then I give a sentence like, I went to the blank. All right, so here we got three different types of questions. I'm gonna split the class up and I'm gonna give one third of the class this first prompt, the second class, the uh, second third of the class, the second one, and the third class, this third one. So I'd have everybody coming in and saying like, all right, this one does not have an H in it, does not have an H in it, this one does, this one does, this one does, this one does, this one does not. Okay, whatever. Then we also have people come in and they do the second one. So um, does that rhyme with fair? No, 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 yes, no, 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 yes, no, no, kind of. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, and then for the next one, does this word fit? I went to the blank. I went to the onion. I guess that could work. I went to the grain. Okay. I went to the hole. No, not spelled like that. I went to the chain. That might work. I went to the hair. Doesn't really work all that well. I went to the check. I don't know. I went to the smell. Uh, maybe. I went to the worth. Okay, that one doesn't work, right? Um, I went to the valid. That doesn't work either. Uh, so... Basically, I'm getting them to respond to these three questions. This is a replication of Craik and Tolving, of a, a really important article they did in 1970. So, um, or maybe 1972. Uh, so, what they found is that the way that you process information can predict how well you remember it later. And 
th that this task is exactly what they did. They brought people in. They didn't tell them this is a memory task. They just asked them to make these judgments about, you know, about these words. And then afterwards, they asked them, we want you to recall as many words as you heard in that list. And of course, the participants were probably really upset. They were like, wait a second. You didn't tell me this was a pop quiz. That's not fair. But what they found is that out of those three different kinds of prompts, that whenever people were asked to comment just on the visual structural component, that this was the worst performance, that people's memory was the worst. When people were asked about does the word sound like something, memory was a little bit better. But whenever they were asked about the meaning of a word, like over here, when I ask, does this word fit into the sentence? And that way, people had the best memory for those words, even when they weren't warned that they were going to be tested on these things. So Craig and Tolving refer to this kind of like as the structural content, you know, the very basic visual structural details of it. Uh, and the final one they call the semantic or the deepest level, which is kind of like understanding how it's related to the world around you, what those things mean, whether they are important to you, whether or not you like them or hate them. Then you can kind of see the, the, oh, I was wrong. It was 1975. I said 72. How foolish. Uh, so you can see the, uh, uh, the data here that the percentage of words recalled, the, and these basically show the exact same kind of information. Um, what you find here is that when you're asked for people to think about the, the, the visuals of you know, these words, that they only remember about 10% of those words. Whenever they are asked about whether it rhymes, they only get about 16%. And then whenever they are asked if it fits in a sentence, then we get about 24%. Huge difference, right? Um, so one thing that I think is really important that a lot of, if you're looking for a connection to the real, real world with this, think about your studying strategies. Oftentimes people will uh, study using flashcards. And whenever they do that, oftentimes they just do one of these first two pieces. They either just think about what the definition looks like so that they could recall the definition if they're given those exact same words, right? Which doesn't happen very much, doesn't happen on my exams. Um, so that's not a very good strategy for memory. Or they just focus on what that definition sounds like. So they might be able to repeat that definition to you, but they don't actually remember what it means. And that's difficult because then if the, you know, if you're asked to apply that information, you can't do it. You can't remember it, right? Um, which is why, you know, remembering what the word means, why it's important, that leads to the deepest level of processing and encoding. That we're more likely to remember things if we process them semantically. If we, don't, if we think about why is this important? Why is this character telling me this in this story? What is the purpose of having you know, that instrument on, you know, this song or whatever. Uh, thinking about the meaning is going to lead to better outcomes for memory. Um, in terms of encoding, the book talks about active encoding and elaborative rehearsal and stuff like that. But really what I want to focus on here is that the way that you pay attention to things whenever you're trying to study it leads to better outcomes in your memory. So what you're looking at right here is uh, looking at um, in the red line, uh, information that was forgotten versus information that was f uh, remembered. And so we're looking here at the prefrontal cortex. Hey, remember when I was saying that the prefrontal cortex, that that's where short-term memory was, right? So what we see here is that whenever somebody is remembering words that they will then later remember, that they have m increased activation in their prefrontal cortex. Whenever they are hearing a word they will eventually forget, we have some activity in the prefrontal cortex, but not as much, right? And so what we're saying here is that the important areas for remembering um, uh, 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 information, we already know the, uh, the medial, front, uh, medial temporal lobe is going to be involved in there because the medial temporal lobe is where the hippocampus is, but also the prefrontal cortex is really important. The more activation in the prefrontal cortex at the time of studying, the higher the recall rate usually. If you want to find some examples, you can probably find some, but that's not true. But for the most part, that is true. Uh, so the more energy that you spend in encoding, the stronger your memory will be. Um, 
just to touch a little bit on elaborate encoding, one of the one of the other things that Craig and Tolving found is that, um, and just you know, I'm not going to go into as much detail about this particular experiment. But what they did in this particular experiment is that they gave people either simple words or complex words, uh, or, sorry, complex sentences, so that you the the, the you know the, the 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 phrase was like encoding is how we take in memories. That is a simple sentence versus we remember things because we store events in a process called encoding, kind of like a computer. As a complex sentence because it has this kind of uh, this hanging clause that modifies uh, in a process called encoding. Um, it's much more complex. And what happens is kind of not really intuitive, that people actually remember this information more when it's more complex. But why is that? What people, the, the, the reason for this, the explanation for why it is that more complex complexity in a sentence like this can lead to better memory outcomes is because it's challenging and because it's challenging it's causing more areas of your prefrontal cortex to be active therefore ensuring that you're more likely to remember it. Why does that happen? What's the behavioral explanation for that? It's probably because whenever you have more information like this you're better able to make connections with things you already know. Maybe there's a word here that sticks out to you like the word computer and that's what helps you remember. Uh, Alright, so um, gonna keep moving I'm not gonna take a break yet but we're we're getting into the final third here I think uh, sorry I have a memory test for you I'm gonna show you these words and I want you to do your best to remember them moth supreme crayon banner mantle calzone personality textbook night wagging justice a vast fracture stamina gloves one more time moth supreme crayon banner mantle calzone personality textbook night wagging justice a vast fracture stamina and gloves okay cool keep those in mind i'm going to test you on them in just a little bit all right so this is another portion that can be interactive but it's really up to you to, to if you wanted to do it you know feel, feel free to to give it a shot um but these are a couple of different um uh examples of working memory tasks that you can find on the internet um, so this is one that I, this is the first one that I posted here for you. Uh, uh, this is a digit span task. This is one of the most common and maybe the most boring. Where here you are going to get, uh, sorry I'm closing out those windows so they don't start playing random advertisements while I'm starting to talk. Uh, if I click new test, I have to remember the number four, one, four, five, two, three. Four, one, four, five, two, three. Okay, cool. I got those correct. But I can also test myself on ten now. Nine, zero, seven, zero, four, three, two, four, six, five. All right. Maybe you, maybe you could get it. I thought about actually trying it, but it would be kind of weird because I'd have to pause out of lecture mode and try to get into studying mode. But if you try to remember this like a phone number, you actually stand a pretty good chance if you try to chunk those three first numbers. But otherwise, if you're trying to remember it like we did the first one, where you're just doing digit by digit, it gets really, really difficult. If you're doing this, that is an example of what we call working memory. Working memory is essentially what we have always called short-term memory. Working memory is a little bit more specific because there are separate pieces of it. Here, you just saw the verbal piece of that because those numbers, we can say out loud. We can say out loud, we can remember them because we can rehearse them to ourselves. I can say, you know, 6264, 6264, 6264 to myself. That makes it a verbal task. Uh, we'll talk about what part of working memory that is in in just a moment. But that's very different from the other section of working memory. The other section of working memory, this is a spatial memory task, would look like this. I'm gonna put this as just three because, um, just to show you what it's like. You're gonna see in this four by four grid, an apple appear three times. And you have to remember where it was and the order. So here we go, new test. All right. So for here, it's right here, right here, and right here. Cool, I got the correct pattern. Now if I bump that up to five now. All 
All right, I remember here, 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 and here. Cool, I got it right again. But when I'm doing this, and if you're doing it too, and I highly recommend that you try it out, um, in whenever you try it out, to think to yourself, like, what's going on in my head? Because that is working memory. Uh, so um, this is a quite a different, quite a different response strategy than the first one, than short-term memory, right? Because you don't, you can't actually say these things out loud because you're just saying apple, 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 apple. And maybe you said bottom left, top over here, bottom right, or something like that, but you're probably not gonna be rehearsing it like that. It's not very efficient to do that. Instead, you're able to just kind of remember the layout. You're able to just remember the visual components of it. And that is the other half of working memory. So working memory has three kind of components. It has two storage buffers, one that's dedicated to verbal information and one that's dedicated just to nonverbal information. All right, so let's get back over here. Um, there's a couple of other uh, examples in case you wanted to give some a try. They're really fun. The end back task is one that you see used all the time in psychology. So it might be kind of a cool one for you to take because it may come up in other classes. Um, the operational span, if you have the textbook, you can try one of those out. The textbook actually has um, a, a fair amount of good um, uh, tests for you to try, uh, like the memory span, which we just did. You can also do the operation span. You can do a sensory memory task. So a sensory memory task over here, and I'm sorry if you can't see all of this. Um, basically, it's very much like the Sperling task where you're gonna get a grid and you have to try to guess and remember which, uh, which are here. Uh, so that's the Sperling task. Um, yeah, and here I just found out about this website not too long ago, so I'm, I'm really psyched about it. Uh, this one has just a ton of experiments that you can try out uh, for totally free. If I wanna do a visual search task, I can click on it and uh, I got or I can download it I got where I can run a demo of it, and it gives me some instructions. Fun stuff. Uh, so give that a shot. You know, if you're if you're curious about those things. So what I've used the phrase working memory a couple of times. What is working memory? Working memory is our and this is a very famous uh, definition. Doesn't really change all that much. Is is the temp is the ability to temporarily store and manipulate information from our environment. And examples of working memory include mental math. So your ability to kind of you know, multiply off the top of your head 13 times 12. You could probably do that. And if you close your eyes and try to imagine those numbers, that's mental math. That's working memory. You can also use mental rotation. So if I asked you, what do you think this thermos looks like if I were to rotate it 180 degrees? That is mental rotation. Reading comprehension, problem solving, those are all elements of working memory. Badly and Hitch uh, uh, formulated this, uh, uh, this model of memory or this explanation of memory in the 70s. Uh, and when they did that, they came up with these three pieces. The phonological loop, which is for verbal info. The visual spatial sketch pad, which is for nonverbal info. And the central executive, which is for attention, which we talked about in chapter nine, uh, <laughs> chapter five. Um, today, short-term memory and working memory are pretty much interchangeable in the way that people use them. Um, for example, when I talked about the four plus or minus one, that Luck and Vogel article, those guys, they refer to it as visual short-term memory instead of visual working memory. So it's really kind of interchangeable these days. Here is kind of a, a, a graphic depiction of it where we have the, you know, the processes that focus our attention up here and, and uh, our uh, nonverbal slash mostly visual info here, and then our auditory info all over here. The episodic buffer is something that Badly uh, introduced in 2000 um, as like an updated part of this model. It doesn't really get talked about all that much. I feel like it wasn't a very popular edition. People weren't super interested in it at that point. Um, people were just like, nope, we like these three things, and we just want to talk about these three things. Uh, so if you're interested in the episodic buffer, you can just Google Badly 2000 episodic buffer and you can find an article about it. Uh, so these first two, the visual spatial sketch pad and phonological loop, are mostly independent. That they happen and they don't really interact all that much, which means that if we wanted to, 
if we wanted to do that task where you're looking, you know, you're trying to remember where the apple was, um, you could probably rehearse somebody's phone number to yourself while you do that because the visual spatial sketch pad is separate from the phonological loop. If you're trying to remember someone's phone number and then someone says, hey, um, could you tell me what are the lyrics to, um, what are the lyrics to, sorry, I rolled over my stylus. Um, what are the lyrics to your favorite song by Taylor Swift or whatever? Uh, if you were doing that, then you would have you probably forget the number you were trying to remember because saying the, the your favorite lyrics is something that is verbal in nature, it is auditory, and it's going to interfere with that. So if you want to try to multitask, then it's a good idea to try to find ways to diverse this, where you're focusing on information that's visual in nature and information that's auditory in nature because you stand a better likelihood of maintaining both of those together. Now your attention kind of being uh, coordinated about, you know, it, are you focusing on the visual or on the auditory info? That is going to be what the central executive takes care of. All right, so according to Baddeley's model, you can memorize visual information and auditory information very well as long as they are separate but that visual information, incoming visual information, is going to interfere with currently existing visual information, and uh, incoming auditory information is going to interfere with current auditory information. You already know this, though, because if you're trying to rehearse a number to yourself, and somebody comes up to you and just says, like, 7731290742116, it's going to disrupt you, because that is trying to enter into your phonological loop. If you're just trying to remember a group of faces, you could probably remember that phone number quite well because those two stimulus types are not competing. All right. The nice thing about Baddeley and Hitch's working memory concept is that it's very simple. It just relies on, you know, basically these three components. And it predicts a lot of very easy behavioral studies. It predicts a lot of, uh, of what you would find when you know, people study memory. But there are some drawbacks to this model, um, which is that when we look at neuroimaging research, there's not, a, there's not like a part of the brain that's, oh, here's where the visual spatial sketch pad is, and here's where the phonological loop is. It doesn't work that simply. Um, and as we'll talk about in a little bit, um, working memory may also include other things like attention and intelligence. Uh, in, uh, in in trying to do working memory tasks, so maybe that should be accounted for as well. Uh, and also does a bad job in talking about abnormal memory conditions such as amnesia, but also talking about other kinds of things that we remember that are not vision and hearing. Here is another kind of um, visual depiction of working memory. But I want to very quickly kind of talk about some of these alternate views of working memory. And I know we've gone on for very long in this video. Just hang with me uh, because uh, I, I want to talk about some of these too. Because um, depending on if you if you decide to go into grad school about you know for experimental psychology, you're going to learn a lot about this stuff. And so I want to make sure to talk a little bit about it. Um, so Kane and Engel, these are two guys from uh, Georgia Tech University. So kind of an engineering school. Uh, and basically, in their research, they were very skeptical that working memory can exist without intelligence or without attention. And it's their view that a lot of working memory tasks will require that you use attention. And so it might be that whenever you are measuring what working memory is, what you're actually doing is measuring the ability for someone to manage their attention. Which would explain why people with ADHD, for example, tend to score pretty poorly on memory tasks. but is that because their memory is bad, or is that because they have problems modulating their attention? Seems like it's probably the second one, right? It's probably an attention problem and not a memory problem. Um, here is another uh, example, uh, another model. Uh, this one from Nelson Cowan. Nelson Cowan, um, uh, basically um, another great researcher. Uh, but his explanation for what working memory is is kind of kind of trippy. I, I like this one. Uh, I like this idea that basically he thinks that that our essentially our brain is the long-term storage unit and that 
our brain can temporarily be activated by certain thought patterns. And those are, whatever areas are active, those areas are now our short-term storage systems. And so according to Cowan, like basically what we're doing is we're using attention to activate different areas of the brain, and that is working memory for him. So working memory is just the part of your brain that you have activated because you are focusing on that information. And then finally we have Postle, who I, who I talked about in the last uh, chapter, uh, very, very in there. Uh, he relies more on neuroimaging data, which makes his kind of a fresh take compared to some of these others. Basically, he thinks that working memory is just kind of like an accident that happens because of the nervous system. That, um, that what we have are these different areas of our nervous system that are still active because they're still kind of perceiving the world and that your prefrontal cortex is going to help kind of guide your attention to the different areas that are active. So he feels like there's not really kind of, you know, like um, a visual memory or an auditory memory. But there's like a memory for pitch, a memory for music, a memory for color, a memory for taste, you know, and that basically every, you know, type of memory you can have is represented somewhere in the brain. All right, now is a really good time to take a pause because we're going to come back and knock out the remaining 10, 15 minutes in just a second. All right, let's do this. So now we are talking about long-term memory long-term memory, it might feel like we cut, we kind of cut this discussion short because in the next chapter we're going to talk a lot about long-term memory. The six things that I want you to think about for, uh, for long-term memory is first that neurons are flexible. Neurons can change over time and they can adapt. Keep that in mind. The next is that connections between neurons can strengthen or weaken. So not only are neurons plastic and can change their own structure, but they can also change the connections between neurons to either make those connections more reliable or to weaken those connections so that they're less reliable. Number three, the more we use a connection between neurons, the stronger that connection usually gets. This is gonna be phrased a lot as um, neurons that fire together wire together. That's kind of fun, right? It rhymes. Um, but on the opposite side, if connections are used or are not used, they weaken over time. Uh, and that's kind of like, because you know researchers are very corny, corny and they can't resist a pun or, or cheap rhyme. They would say that neurons that lose, well, what is it? Um, neurons out of sync lose link something like that instead of fire together wire together fire together wire together is good lose sync or out of sync lose link that's not good that that's kind of bad uh, number five and but I think of this as kind of like you use it or you lose it if you do, are not using those memories you might lose those memories new connections are made all the time so that every step of these are constantly changing because these connections are changing all the time and then finally these neurons don't live forever they can die off and that is what we experience when we experience things like amnesia um, that they just don't live forever so that might also be one of the reasons why we can forget things over time all right so one uh, leading conceptualization for long-term memory is called spreading activation Spreading activation is this idea that when we activate any kind of memory we have in our brain, we're also going to be activating memories of things that are related to that central memory. So for example, if I am thinking about coffee, because you know I'm always thinking about coffee, I'm also thinking about Starbucks, I'm thinking about hot liquids, I'm thinking about creamer and dairy, I'm thinking about the color brown, I'm thinking about Splenda and sugar, I'm thinking about um, Dunkin' Donuts and donuts. Uh, I'm thinking about um, butter pecan swirl, you know, caramel swirl, mocha swirl, these different kinds of things you can add uh, to your coffees. So whenever I'm thinking about coffee, I am also kind of activating these ideas that are also related to the idea of coffee. Um, so if I were to 
think of bird, I might think, oh, a bird has wings, it can fly, it has feathers. Another bird is a canary, and canaries sing. Uh, they're kind of yellow, and you can have them as a pet if you want to. Uh, birds are not bats. They're different from bats. But bats can fly, and they do have wings, too. But one thing that's different about them is they have fur. What you just experienced is sprouting activation. It feels like loose associations, but what you're doing is whenever you activate some idea in your brain, uh, it's going to be activating other concepts that are linked together, that maybe have stronger connections with this particular neuron. And so in that way, activation spreads, and that's what we call it spreading activation. And that also means that if you, know, if I, if you were to ask me about coffee, and then you followed up that question by asking me uh, about Starbucks or about Dunkin' Donuts, I'm gonna be right there with you. I'm not gonna forget briefly what we're talking about because all that stuff is still active in my head. And there's a couple of other ideas that we're gonna talk about next chapter that we'll, in, that, that we'll see here too when we talk about different tricks for remembering things. Um, but this lead, but I'm not going to get into that because I want to talk about priming because priming is a very important area of psychology. Um, it's used a lot in social psychology and it's used a lot in counseling and clinical research too. And it kind of came out of cognitive research from the 70s. Basically, uh, these two researchers were judging whether or not a pair of items were real words or fake words. That is the instructions they had for participants. Press this button if these two words are real. Press this button if one of these words is fake. And they had uh, people come in and uh, do this for a bunch of words. But they were sneaky because they had two different pairs. They had some pairs where there was a relationship between the two words, such as bread and butter, or book and page, or fire and warm, things like that. And they had other pairings when they were unrelated. This would be like bread and sky or bread and mechanic or something like that they're not related right um, and very interestingly what they found is that whenever these words were related people were very good and very fast at saying that yes they are both words whenever one of the word whenever the words were unrelated even if they were real words it took them it always took them longer to say those are real words when they weren't related. So there's something about how they are related that makes them faster. What is it? It's because you see one of these, you see the word bread, and that spreading activation is going to also activate your memory or your, you know, your, your awareness of butter, of toast, of ham, and of cheese, and things like that. So speaking of, um, um, speaking of retrieval cues, come back over here and see how well you do in the word stem completion. Remember, I gave you 15 words at the beginning of this section, and I asked you to try to remember them. See if you can see what you can remember here. So do your best. All right, so here, this is kind of fun. I wish I could ask you what you got, but um, you may have had the word, you, were, you may have wrote moth, and you may have wrote supreme, and you may have wor wrote the word crayon, and you may have wrote the word banner. And if you did, that's, very, that's really kind of nifty, because what you did, and I'm going to backpedal a second here, what you did is you memorized, sorry, it's further back than I thought, you memorized these words right here, but maybe you didn't know it, because if I asked you to, to write all those down, you probably wouldn't do such a good job. But because you see these word stems, they are going to help you retrieve the remaining part of those words. And the reason why the, I'm bringing this up in a discussion about priming is because if you ha weren't paying attention at all when I asked you to read those, then you may, you almost certainly came up with different words because the most common word with M-O-T is not moth, it's mother or motel. Those are both much more common words than moth. Same thing for supreme. The word super is much more common than the word supreme. For crayon, the word crazy is much more common than crayon. For banner, the, the oh, I don't know, I don't, I actually don't remember what the most common one for that is, but it might be banned or something like that. Um, the point is, 
that your previous exposure to that list changes the way you retrieve those word cues. The power law of learning, uh, and this is also referred to as implicit memory, which is an idea we will talk about next chapter. The power law of learning, not discussed very, very long in the book, but the idea is that um, as you begin to practice, because anytime we start talking about expertise or learning skills, we're also going to be talking about long-term uh, memory for that. What you're looking at here was, I, oh, this was a really, it was a really dumb task. I don't remember exactly what it was. It was something like you had to click every time you saw the color green or something like that. Um, what they found is that uh, people, and this is their recognition time, so this is like essentially how fast they are, and so the, the lower the better, right? And so you can see on the first day, it took about a second, a uh, second and a half to respond. Second day, it took a second and a half to respond. Third day, and a second and a fifth. The fourth day, almost one second. And then there gets to be a point where we start to kind of flatten here. And we stop, it takes longer and longer and longer for you to see any kind of difference in with what you are practicing. That follows a log function. So that's why we call it the power law of learning. Um, this leads us to LTP, which is long-term potentiation. Long-term potentiation is a neural explanation for long-term memory, which is essentially that um, the more you act, the more you use this neuron and the neurons associated with it, the easier it is to access and the more enduring it is going to be. And we see a lot of long-term potentiation, this process where this neuron becomes strengthened and creates new connections between other neurons. Uh, we see this happening in the hippocampus. So we see it using in the area of the brain that helps kind of consolidate these memories. And it works like a use it or lose it function like I mentioned earlier. There is uh, some, uh, some really great notes that somebody took, uh, found this online. Because I, I tried to Google like, you know, image of long-term potentiation, and I couldn't find a good one except for you know, these notes that somebody took here. And that's all that we have for chapter number one. I'm sorry that was so long, but it's a very big chapter. Uh, chapter seven will be a little bit shorter, but it's also going to be kind of long too. I've got a lot of demonstrations and things for you to try out there, just like I did here. Uh, so I hope you had a good time. hope you learned something about your memory. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Otherwise, I will see you in Chapter 7 where we talk a little bit more about memory. And ultimately, my goal there is for you to learn the first 100 digits of the number pi. So you know pi 3.14. My goal is that at the end of the chapter, you have all the tools you need to go from 1.314 to 1.1. Point, sorry, to 3.1. Four, one, five, four, seven, nine, and so on. All right, I'll see you later.